Firstly, the Shahada. Let me inscribe this for you, just in case your Arabic's a bit rusty. Um, Shahada means testifying, bearing witness. Um, Islam prefers to use this expression to say what might be the Christian equivalent of creed. Um, this reflects the Quranic conviction that religious confidence is not something that is so much acquired as innate. One of the key differences between Muslim and Christian theology is that Islam doesn't accept the idea of original sin. Infants are not born in some sinful state. They are born pure, they are made sinful by their circumstances as they grow up. So to carry out the shahada, to bear witness, is to testify to something that we knew as disembodied souls before we were breathed, as the Quran puts it, into the, the embryo in our mother's womb. Um, now this formula, which is probably the most frequently repeated set of words on the planet, is Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammadan rasulullah um, More simply La ilaha illallah, Muhammadun Rasulullah, which means there is no deity, no object of worship other than the God, Allah. Muhammadun Rasulullah, Muhammad is the messenger of God. Now these words punctuate every dimension of the Muslim life. They're the first words that a baby hears once it's brought into the world. The father whispers the formula into its ear. They are the words that dying Muslims strain to pronounce as they are leaving the world. Simply repeating them to a witness is all that is required to convert to Islam. They are repeated dozens of times a day. They come up in the five daily prayers, for instance, and in other situations. Um, you'll see them scribbled by enthusiastic, devout hands on the walls of, of city buses. Um, you'll see them on coinage and banknotes. You'll see them on the Saudi Arabian flag. If you've seen it, you know it's basically a green flag with a sword and there's an Arabic script. And this is what it says. Um, you can see them in elaborate calligraphy on bumper stickers. Um, every, ser every Friday sermon begins with, with these words. Now you can see th these for those who like comparisons, as the Muslim equivalent of the Christian defining symbol of the Christian faith, which is, of course, the cross. The cross, one of the great symbols of, of, of um, world religions, denotes the intersection of heaven and earth, the vertical and the horizontal. And that's what the Shahada is doing as well. The first phrase of the Shahada affirms a metaphysical, almost hermetic truth. Only God is God. It doesn't attempt a definition of God. Language can't do that. It says, there is nothing worthy of worship, nothing worthy of having divinity or ultimate reality attributed to it except the God, except Allah. That's the vertical, metaphysical dimension. And the second is, as it were, the horizontal, which connects the metaphysical to the physical, to the human plane. Muhammad or Rasulullah, Muhammad is the messenger of God. He is the one that connects heaven with earth. So this phrase, rather than any visible symbol is, if you like, the, the representation of the religion of Islam. Sometimes people think that the crescent and star are the symbol of the Islamic religion, and they have become so in many Muslim societies. You'll see them on top of minarets, domes, tombs, etc. But in fact, the crescent is not the defining symbol of Islam in the way that the cross is for Christianity. Um, the crescent, in fact, was not used as a symbol for the religion until the 15th century. This is as far as we can discern, although we find crescents in a fairly old Islamic fabrics and uh, textiles. Um, it denoted the religion of Islam on a sort of reliable and definitive basis only following the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople in 1453. Because the symbol of the city of Constantinople is the crescent. And the reason for that is that it has Marian associations. 
the Cathedral Church of Constantinople, Hagia Sophia, holy wisdom is dedicated to the Blessed Virgin. And in Christian iconography, the crescent is often associated with the Virgin because she is queen of heaven. So blue is her color, there are stars, and she stands sometimes on a crescent moon. So um, the Ottoman Turks adopted the symbol of the city of Constantinople, which was now their capital, um, as the emblem of their state, and hence by extension of the religion of Islam. Among Shia Muslims, um, you won't find the crescent, but quite often you will find a hand. You'll see it on top of a dome or a minaret. And this is the hand of the Prophet's daughter, Fatima. And it has a number of spiritual um, um, symbolic significances, uh, the most obvious of which is that the um, five pillars of Islam are represented by the hand, with the shahada, this first pillar, being the thumb, without which the other four fingers are not operable. So this is the, the defining symbol of Islam. And just as the crucifix tends to articulate sacred space in Christian architecture, this um, intersection, this cruciform aspect of belief also determines mosque architecture. In building mosques, Muslims have done all kinds of things. Actually, mosques are more diverse generally in their architecture than a, than a church is. If you go to a mosque, if you, a mosque in Nigeria, for instance, It'll look like a traditional Nigerian building, mud brick and so forth. If you visit a church in Nigeria, it will tend to approximate to the ch Gothic church architecture of Europe or America. Nonetheless, Muslims have tended to gravitate towards a particular form when designing mosques. And this is, of course, the cube surmounted by the hemisphere or the dome. That's the classic style of mosque. And this is a representation in visual form of the Shahada. The cube represents the earth because it's the four points of the compass. It's the material world, hence it's the second shahada. And the first one, uh, the metaphysical truth, is represented by the heavens, hence the dome. Um, and there's even a developed theory, for instance, in Islamic calligraphy, um, which holds that there are vertical strokes in the Arabic script and there are horizontal movements, and the vertical represents divine intervention in human history as it progresses, and the horizontal represents um, humanity's progress through history. So again, you have these two fundamental beliefs invoked in, in Islamic art. Also, this polarity exists in the distinction between the two principal sacred cities of Islam, which are Mecca and Medina. Mecca was the place where the revelation descended, first of all, on the Prophet. Um, the metaphysical verses of the Quran were made manifest there. The Kaaba is the image of the divine throne, and the pilgrims milling around it recall the adoring angels. Of course, the Kaaba is also the archetype for the mosque because it's a cube. It doesn't have a dome because the heaven itself, the hemisphere, is above it. Um, Medina is the locus of the Sharia. It is where the formal practices and laws of the religion were revealed to the Prophet. Hence, it's the city of the Prophet. He's buried there and it's the city of the second Shahada. So devotional poetry about Mecca, um, written by Muslims, tends to focus on God. Devotional poetry about Medina tends to focus on the Prophet. So by uttering these few words, one affirms one's full membership of Islam. But although the theologians aver that because of God's mercy, uh, however much one sins, one cannot be punished eternally um, if, if one has affirmed this shahada. It's recognized that one's Islam is gravely lacking if one goes no further. You have to accept the entailment of Muhammad's prophecy, the other four pillars. These are the fingers to the shahada's thumb. 